Hi there. Welcome to the Aquarium Online Academy. I'm Stacy here at the Aquarium of the Pacific, and we're going to be taking a look behind the scenes at how to build a tropical exhibit. Something kind of like this, except maybe a little smaller with some live coral. So uh, thanks so much for your patience. It took us a little bit. We had some uh, technical difficulties, but we are ready to go. Now, if you have any thoughts you'd like to share or any questions that you want to ask, we encourage you to text us. Our number is right here, here, there we go, here. <laughs> It's 562-286-1838. Now, if you are watching this at a later time and we're not streaming live, you can also ask questions through email. And that email ad address is just down there as well. It's live at lbaop.org. So you have a couple of different ways to reach us. Now, if you are texting and uh, you need to ask permission, please do because texting rates will apply, okay? All right, well, I hope that you are ready to explore a tropical reef because that's basically what we're going to do. Now, whenever you want to uh, build an exhibit, one of the first things that you want to do is pick a target animal. And after you pick that target animal, you want to learn all you can about that animal and its life in its native habitat so that you know what it needs in order to survive. Now, for, um, for a tropical exhibit such as this, what we're looking at first is coral. Now, did you know that coral is an animal? Because it absolutely is. So coral is a living animal. In fact, uh, most of the corals that you see here are actually a colony of animals. It's a whole bunch of animals that live together to make up one piece of coral. Now, each of those animals are called polyps. And um, the polyps can be on the slightly larger side and some of them can be a little bit on the smaller side and it really just depends on which kind of coral um, you are looking at and coral also comes in i mean there are so many different kinds of corals out there it comes in a few different varieties one other way that you can split them up is um, a hard coral versus a soft coral now you may have heard those terms before um, but a hard coral is basically a reef building coral. So if you think about like the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, those ones, um, a lot of them are those hard corals. What it means is it doesn't have a skeleton like us, but it does have a hard component of its body made of something called calcium carbonate. And it basically builds that kind of hard skeleton to create the structure. And then the polyps live within that skeleton. So what we're looking at here is um, you can't really see the skeleton because it's covered in the tissues or kind of like the, the bodies of the, of the polyps. So each stock that you see here is a polyp. Okay, so you can see this one piece actually has many, many, many polyps here. And sometimes they, um, they come out of the skeleton and they reach out and they try to feed. And other times they're just kind of tucked in and that's okay. They all kind of work together for, uh, to kind of have success together. All right. So, um, so how does this even grow? That's actually a question that we have. How do you even make coral? Well, since coral is an animal, it has to be healthy. And when it's healthy, it can grow. So what I would love to do right now is actually look at this hard skeleton um, over on our document camera. So let's get a close look at what these skeletons might look like. Now, there, like I said earlier, there are lots and lots of different kinds of coral and you can see just four types here. Um, what we're really going to focus on are, um, is this one right here. This is a kind of branching coral. You can see how it gets its name because it kind of looks like branches of a tree. What I would love to do is get a nice close look. So I'm going to be zooming it in. Drum. And when it focuses, we can get a good look here. All right, so this is that hard skeleton. So if you were to touch this, it's very rough, almost jagged-like, and very tough. However, it's still fragile. It's still made of calcium carbonate in, in a way similar to a shell. And so if I was to drop it, it would shatter, which is not good. So we're going to be real gentle with it. Now, each hole that you see here would have one of those little polyps. Okay, so you can kind of see how many polyps this one piece would have. It's really quite incredible. And again, they all work together to form almost like one animal. They work in a colony, um, kind of all together. It's pretty great. 
All right, so that is the hard coral. So they are, remember, they have this hard calcium carbonate skeleton. Now, another kind of coral that you have is soft coral. And soft coral does have calcium carbonate. It is still part of their bodies, but they don't create this hard structure. In fact, they're really quite flexible. And that's one of the reasons why they're called soft corals. And now, how would you know between the two? Well, one really easy thing to do is actually look at those corals. And if you see any corals here that seem to be a little bendy, you have found some soft coral. So have you found any? Right here, right? It's kind of, it almost looks like one of those like inflatable tube men. <laughs> That's what it reminds me of. So, um, so that is one kind of soft coral. We also have another one down here. Do you see how it just kind of flexes um, when there's movement in the water? Those are the soft corals. Look at this one. Pretty not movie, right? It's pretty stationary. This is going to be one of your hard corals. So they do live together in, um, in a coral reef. Um, and they do kind of require slightly different things. And so a lot of times when you look at um, our exhibits here at the aquarium, we do try to integrate the two of them. Typically hobbyists at home tend to have the hard corals. They're kind of the ones that are, um, they're just more interesting for, for people in general. Okay, so here's uh, some of our coral polyps on the move. This is when the water is moving around, but you can see that it's the tentacles that are moving. The other part of it here is not, it's quite stationary. So again, a nice hard coral there. All right, so we know a little bit about the two kinds of coral, right? The hard corals that build reefs and then the softer corals that are a little bit more flexible. So let's learn a little bit more about just a polyp in general. Now, corals are typically found in warm water um, especially the reef building corals. They're typically found in warm water that is fairly shallow. And one of the reasons why they need that is because they need exposure to sunlight. Coral has evolved this really interesting relationship with a kind of algae. Now, algae is, is basically seaweed, but there's more algaes than just seaweed. And this algae that I'm talking about is microscopic. It's so tiny, you cannot see it with just your eyeballs. You actually need to use a microscope in order to see it. And it's called zooxanthellae. It's a very large word. But zooxanthellae is a kind of algae that lives in the tissues of those coral polyps. And it seems kind of weird, right? So basically the coral polyp is an animal and it integrates the algae into its tissues. Now, this is a great relationship. The coral actually protects the algae. It's hard to eat algae if it's inside here, right? So the coral is protecting that algae. The other thing that's kind of amazing, remember coral's an animal, right? So if it's an animal, it has to go to the bathroom. Well, that's nutrients, it's fertilizer. So it's actually giving the algae the nutrients that it needs to live. And the other thing too, is because coral's an animal, it uses oxygen and it gives off carbon dioxide, just like this. When you breathe in, your body is trying to get oxygen. When you breathe out, your body is getting rid of carbon dioxide. And that's basically what's going on with these coral polyps as well. Now, they don't breathe the same way we do. There is gas exchange, though, in their tissues here. So, um, so what's going on is it's using up oxygen. It wants to get rid of that carbon dioxide. And the algae is like, hey, I'll take it, because that's what algae needs in order to uh, make its own energy. So the algaes in here um, have a great place to live. The coral gives it everything it needs except for sunlight. But that's why they live in shallow water because that sunlight in shallow water gets to the coral. If it lived in really, really deep water, then um, it wouldn't really have all that, um, that bright sunlight in order to photosynthesize because an algae can photosynthesize just like a plant in order to make its own energy. Okay, so we know what the algae is getting out of this. What about the coral? Why does the coral even want the algae in its tissues in the first place? Well, for a few really important reasons. The coral is actually getting the oxygen from the algae. So just like a plant, it's making oxygen. So the coral's like, sweet, I'll take it. And then um, the other thing too is that algae is making energy from the sunlight and the nutrients from the coral's waste. Now, it can't use all the energy. So it actually gives some of it to the coral that it lives in. This is a really great relationship. They really do take care of each other. It's like they're kind of making food for each other and protecting each other in a way. Now, corals do try to eat. They try to eat as much as they can out there. But if you think about those warm tropical 
tropical waters, you also may realize that the water is pretty crystal clear. And that's because there's not very many nutrients in this water. So here is um, appealing for their beauty. Of actual coral, coral reefs out there in the ocean. are the rainforests of the sea. The water is crystal clear blue. And so, one of the richest uh, reef areas in the world is underappreciated the so they really do rely and understudied on the and not yet fully understood. Now you may also be Known as the Coral Triangle, it encompasses portions of the Philippines, types of corals, Indonesia, Timor-Leste, Papua New Guinea, right and the Solomon Islands. Is a place that's called the Coral Triangle. Out there Home the to more than 500 hard coral species. More than anywhere uh, else uh, in the world, coral reef ecosystems, lots and lots the coral triangle so also supports 40% of, um, of all reef fish species. And the interaction that it has with the Why is this region so biologically around. diverse? So, um, this is a really good place to, to learn with the gradual more, so rise and fall of sea levels, home, land barriers home, isolated reef communities. And even invertebrates like uh, ocean currents and also limit the exchange of larvae among what, distant uh, communities. What matches together. All right, cool. So we know all about these corals. Now, what about building the exhibit? Well, we need clear, warm water. We need lots of light. We need water that moves. Okay, we saw that in in those videos. There, we need that water to move. We also need to make sure that the chemistry of the water is good for the health and growth of coral. So what does that mean? Well, it means it has all the compounds that corals need in order to grow. Something like calcium carbonate, for example. Remember, that's the thing that's floating around in the water. It's microscopic that the coral is, um, is absorbing in and building their skeletons. Okay, so those are the kinds of things that we need. So how do we accomplish that in a place like the Aquarium of the Pacific? Well, let's take those things one at a time. First off here, they, these are some reactors. This is part of the filtration that we use to help us um, have kind of a perfect environment for our corals. Now, uh, you'll notice here that there's a bunch of different towers. There's a couple here, there's a couple here, and each of these towers kind of does some different things. Some of this um, is taking this thing called phosphates out of the water. Phosphates are basically something that algae really needs to grow. Now, what I'm talking about when I say algae here is the stuff that carpets uh, rocks. So like if you have a pond, or if you've ever seen a pond before, all that kind of slimy green stuff, that's the algae I'm talking about. If there's lots of phosphates in the water, a lot of that grows. Guess what? It competes with coral for space. So we want to make sure there's not so much of it in there. So one of these reactors here is actually responsible for taking phosphates out of the water. The other tower is actually really good at taking some particles out of the water because when you have things like um, fish and urchins and sea stars living in the water, well, they go to the bathroom too. And so all of that waste gets in the water, then it's getting kind of cloudy. Maybe it's not so good. You end up getting a lot of um, waste products in that water which is not healthy for our animals, right? So we need to filter that out. So we have a carbon reactor here that helps us to filter that out. Now we also have uh, sand filters. We actually have a lot of sand filters for this, um, for this exhibit here. And basically, if you think about this, it's just like a giant tub of sand. And when the water flows through this giant tub of sand, the sand is actually capturing a lot of those particles. So you can see here, this is a giant tub. There's a giant tub. There's actually, I think, a couple more giant tubs in here as well. Um, we have them all over the aquarium because it's a really effective way to get chunks out of the water. Um, so that could be leftover food. It could be waste from fish. Um, that's what we definitely want, right? And then the other thing that we have featured here that's kind of fun to see are these right here. They're colorful, and I think that's one of the things I love so much about it. But these things right here are actually a couple of the pumps that we use to move the water around. You can see all of the different pipes that we have here, the different components, like these, um, these sand filters. We have a a bio tower that I'll talk about in a little bit. We have something called a protein skimmer. We have all kinds of different parts of filtration here and that water needs to move through all of that. And we have to accomplish that by using pumps. 
like the ones that you see here. When you deal with really large exhibits that move large volumes of water, you need really big pumps. And you probably need multiples of those pumps as well. So that's why you see a couple of them right here. Okay, so the other thing um, about filtration uh, that I really wanted to talk about are protein skimmers. We do have these in a lot of our exhibits because it does exactly what it's called. It skims off proteins. Now, what does that mean? Well, waste has protein in it. Also, leftover food, right? If, uh, if say, there's a crab in there and it eats, Crabs shred their food, and so food particles go everywhere. Some things eat it, some things just kind of, you know, can't quite get it, so it might just float around in the water. So we want to get rid of any dissolved proteins because too much dissolved proteins can actually make the water quality not so great. So we have these things installed. These are protein skimmers. So basically what it does is this is exhibit water that goes into this little container here. We have um, bubbles that get injected into here. So if air shoots in there, makes lots and lots of bubbles. Proteins love bubbles. So they're getting stuck to all the bubbles and it makes the bubbles maybe even bigger and stronger and thicker. So this is crazy. They actually bubble up and out into this top section. And this top section, if those bubbles pop and become liquidy again, it can go in this drain tube right there. Or we just open up the lid and we clean it out. So we're talking about waste, food waste, fish waste. That's what all these bubbles are. Guess what? The ocean does it too. Have you ever been to the beach or seen pictures of a beach that has lots of foam? Same thing. Now you know. So, you know, in the foam. Hmm. Brings a whole other meaning to that, right? All right. So we have a question here from Malia. When do the towers filter? Is it all the time or only if over? Oh, that's a great question. When is all this filtration happening? It's happening all the time, like all the time. All around the aquarium, I think we have 1.2 million gallons of water, maybe a little bit more than that because we've been um, kind of increasing some of our holding areas. And uh, we filter about a million gallons of water an hour. So just imagine all throughout the aquarium, almost our entire um, volume of water is being filtered and cleaned. But this is what's necessary to make sure that our animals are in the most healthy environment that they can possibly be. So, uh, so that's why filtration is so very important. Okay, so now we have the clean, crystal clear water, right? So what about that light? Remember, we need to have a lot of light so for a corals that zooxanthellae can thrive. So what are we going to use then? Well, there are a few different kinds of lights out there, but here, for, especially for our coral exhibits, we like to use LEDs. And LEDs are good for a few reasons. Number one, they, um, they're more efficient. So they use a little bit less energy for the amount of, of light that we're gonna get from it. They also last a little bit longer than the old traditional bulbs that we used to use. And the other thing that's really cool about these lights is that you can tune in the color spectrum. Now, what does that even mean? Well, here are our LED lights here, okay? Now, if you have ever seen a rainbow before, you've seen the color spectrum of sunlight. So sunlight is not just bright white, it's actually a whole bunch of colors, Roy G. Biv, <laughs> um, that are kind of joined together to make white light. So LEDs allow us to tune in for certain colors. Maybe you want a little bit more blue. Maybe you want a little bit more yellow. It probably depends on the exhibit that you have, okay? So these lights allow us to make sure we're getting just the right spectrum for coral health and growth. The other thing that's really cool is if you tune in the light in a certain way, you can even make the, the colors in the corals more vibrant and more colorful. So they even look really cool. Not only health and growth, but also looking cool. I'm all down for that. So, um, so as you can see here, these lights have been tuned in to really make these corals nice and vibrant, nice and colorful. So lights are very important. Okay, so we have clear water nice bright light that can go through that clear water and get to the corals. We also need to make sure that the water itself is moving. 
So that helps to put that water into our filtration system behind the scenes. But it is also important because there are lots of particles in water and that those particles can land on the coral. Now, if you think about this, it's just like the dust that attracts at home, right? Have you ever looked at like a, a desk or a bookshelf that you haven't dusted for a while and you get all like that layer of stuff there? Well, that happens to corals too. And so having water flow going through the exhibit actually brushes that off of the coral, which is a really good thing because we want that coral to have access to all that light, right? So some corals need a, a stronger flow. Some of them need a weaker flow. So we put, um, we put like, uh, like kind of pumps inside the exhibit at different places so we get different levels of flow. Well, how do you know which corals like what? That's when you go back out to the ocean again and you look at where those corals typically live and that tells you where to place them in your exhibit. So as you can see here, some of these corals like lot, a lot more flow. These ones in particular, it seems like they like it, uh, they like a lot of flow because they, they like to kind of wiggle. Remember that wacky inflatable tube band thing. Okay, and then there's other corals like these hard corals that if the flow is too rough, it can actually break them. So again, going out into the ocean, learning about the different species helps us put them in the right place in our exhibit for optimum health and growth. Very important stuff. Now, all of those gauges that you saw just a moment ago, these gauges help us to monitor things like flow, like the temperature, and even the pH of the exhibit. Now, for our big live coral exhibit, we don't just have one gauge, as you can see. These five gauges are only for one section of the filtration. So we're actually not just monitoring the exhibit as a whole, but even different components of the exhibit to make sure that everything is keyed in perfectly. Now, what's really cool about our system too is it's hooked up to this monitoring system where if one of these gauges is showing something that it should not be showing, maybe it's um, the flow is too fast or it's too slow, it actually sets off an alarm. And that then allows us to know, uh-oh, something's wrong. We can go there very quickly and fix it and that allows us then to have, um, to be able to monitor so many different exhibits all around the aquarium and not have to have a person sitting there and staring at it all the time. So this system is really helpful for the people who take care of exhibits like this, um, such as our aquarists who care for the fish and invertebrates here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. Now, the last thing that we want to make sure we have is enough of the things that these corals need in order to grow. When we talked about that calcium carbonate, right? That stuff that's kind of in the water that um, the coral puts in their body to help them grow. Well, the other thing is that they need food. They need nutrients. Now the zooxanthellae, that algae that lives in their tissues is essential for that. But we found that if you actually feed corals, they're going to be healthier too. So yes, we actually feed our corals. And when we do that, we get nice, healthy corals like this that our animals love to use. See that little one? I just love this picture. Okay, so, um, so what do you feed a coral? Well, one of the things, if you look at this exhibit, there's a lot of coral here, right? If we just threw food in there, we don't know who's getting what. So we actually have to have an aquarist dive into this exhibit. So they go inside in order to feed the different corals. And they feed different things depending on the size of the coral. If the polyp, remember that little, the little part um, that lives inside the holes of the hard coral? If that polyp is big, then it can eat things like a mycid shrimp, which is a little shrimp maybe about that big. Or it could even eat krill, which is another sh small shrimp-like creature. But if it's a tiny polyp, because some corals have little tiny polyps, it's going to need to eat microscopic things. I'm talking about something called a copepod. Now, if any of you have ever watched SpongeBob SquarePants and you know plankton, that, my friends, is a copepod. Yes, those animals really do exist. It looks like a little rice grain with one eye and antenna. 
that's a real animal. Those are called copepods, and we see a lot of them here um, in our waters. You don't get quite as many of them in the tropics, but they still do exist. But that's something that we would feed our corals. So our aquarist goes diving into there, has different kinds of food, and makes sure that each coral gets the right type of food. Now, how often do we feed? Well, it depends on the corals. Hard corals like this get fed two to three times a week, um, and they do really well with it. Now, here's a fun thing. We actually have an exhibit here of corals that don't have algae in their systems that photosynthesize. So they need to be fed more often. So remember, this kind of exhibit, two to three times a week. An exhibit with no zooxanthellae, it's many times a day day. We're talking three to four times a day. So that's a very different way to feed. And it's all because we know more about the coral. We know that these ones have zooxanthellae that feed them a lot. And we know that the, um, the corals that don't have the zooxanthellae need to be fed more often. So we have beautiful coral. It's nice and healthy. We know how to care for it. Let's add some fish. What kind of fish? Well, what lives with coral? That's where you start, right? So all of these fish here are typically found in a coral reef. And the other thing that you want to be really careful of, especially when you have live coral like this, is that the fish you choose are coral safe. It means they don't eat coral. Because there are some fish out there, like the parrotfish, for example, who do actually take bites of coral. And, and they can digest what they get, um, like the tissues and things of the coral and the stuff that lands on coral and everything. So this is an example of a parrotfish. You can see its beak-like mouth right there, perfect for taking a bite of that hard skeleton. And so you don't want fish like this in with your live coral if you want your live coral to grow a lot. So we make sure that these fish live in an exhibit that has artificial coral. Then we don't have to worry about that. There are also a few other animals out there that eat coral too. So it's always good to know what the diet is of those animals. The other thing that we have to make sure of is that they're compatible with each other, that you know that they will get along. If you have a whole lot of very territorial fish together, they're not going to do so well. So we take a look at their natural, um, their natural behaviors. These fish do very well together and that's one of the reasons why we place them together. The last thing to look at is their size. Because when you have a coral exhibit and you buy a fish, if it's a fish that will outgrow that exhibit, that can be a problem. Now here at the aquarium, we actually have many different size exhibits. So we can actually move them from one smaller area to a slightly larger area, even to our largest exhibit here, 350,000 gallons of water, and that is our big tropical reef exhibit. So we can actually move them from one stage to the next stage to the next stage. But if you were to have a coral exhibit at home, you may not have that option. So it's always good to know what the maximum size of the fish is so it doesn't outgrow your exhibit. Well, my friends, we now have a beautiful exhibit full of nice, healthy coral and lots and lots of fish. Now again, this here is our 350,000 gallon exhibit, our big tropical reef exhibit here. Um, but these are not live coral. We do use artificial coral and the fish use it in the same exact way. And that's one of the reasons why we can have such a large exhibit featuring so many coral reef animals. Now I do want to thank you so much for joining our programs today. It was a lot of fun. Um, oh, it looks like we have a couple questions here, so we'll make sure we get to those. Bella, hi Bella. Um, how long does it take for a single coral to form? Oh man, a long time. Coral growth is pretty slow. And um, when they start out, they're microscopic. That means so small, you cannot see them. And so it takes years for coral to grow um, large enough that it kind of is there, that you can see it. But if you're talking about a piece that's like this big here, this is gonna be years and years and years of growth. So if, you, if this was made of real coral, we're talking about maybe even a thousand, 2,000 years of growth. So it's kind of crazy. Coral's pretty slow growing. Some only grow maybe a, fill, a few millimeters a year millimeters. That's itty bitty. Others can grow up to several inches a year. So it just depends on the type of coral. And then we have a question from Brandon. How do corals go to the restroom and how do they digest food? Aha, I love it. Let's take a look at coral polyps again. 
Now, a coral polyp, remember, that's that one little animal that lives in the hole of that coral, um, of, of the coral skeleton. So we have many, 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 many polyps that make up a piece of coral. Now, that polyp is a cousin of a jelly or a cousin of a sea anemone, if you know what those kind of look like. So they're related and they, they kind of live in a very similar way. So all of the tentacles that you see in the polyp, that's what's going to help them to capture any food that might be um, floating around in the water. And then in the very center of that polyp, so we can see all the tentacles here, in the very center of the polyp is actually its mouth. It's, it only has one opening. In, in reality. So the food goes in the mouth there. Inside this portion is where the food would digest. And then when the food is digested, they have waste left, right? Well, it comes right back out the same place. So, um, so again, they only have just one body opening. You can kind of see it a little bit on this one down here. So the food goes in there, it digests, and whatever's left over comes right back out again. So there you go. That is how corals go to the restroom and also how they digest. All right. Well, thanks again for joining us. If you do have more questions that you would love to have answered, please email us. The email address is live at lbaop.org. I hope you have a nice weekend, everyone. Bye.